today, we're going to be talking about how to make a film that's going to serve as a great credit, a great festival entry, and maybe even something you can sell. I think this is an important event because things, if things go wrong on your first film, the chance that you're going to make a second film goes down significantly. And that's something that you decide. And you do it, you make that decision actually in the earliest days of your film project. You decide very early on what kind of project it's going to be. You also start determining what you're going to spend, when it's going to be finished, what it will showcase, and where it will be seen. Your first film is almost certainly not going to be financially profitable, particularly in the short term. And in that sense, it's a true investment. And it's a key investment because you're likely to spend thousands of dollars on it, and it will be a key calling card for years to come. Now, as we dive into this, I am going to just put out a little disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a tax advisor. I'm not a financial advisor. So don't rely on this presentation for that kind of advice. Producing a film has risks and costs that have to be addressed. And it may create tax advantages and tax deductions that you qualify for. But in order to take advantage of those benefits, you really need to get specific advice related to your project and your situation from experts. This workshop is really meant to provide a framework and a footing to help you become familiar with the process, not serve as a one size fits all advice. I have done several workshops where I've talked to attorneys about issues like copyright, contract law, et cetera, which you can find on my website. Check the episodes to get some understanding of the fundamentals. When it comes to defining what's a triumph and what's a disaster, I think we have to really be candid about what's going to make your film a success or how you're going to define success versus how you're going to define failure. For example, I personally consider a disaster to be a first film that costs lots of time and money and never actually gets made. And that is a huge percentage of first films. In fact, almost any film that starts with the sentence, it's a $5 million film. It's my first film and I know that's a lot, but I'm still going to produce a $5 million first film. You know, with a million dollars, you can buy a house. With $5 million, you can build an apartment building. So it's when people say that they are going to produce a film at this level and they have never in this to film before, that's a lot of red flags and it usually spells disaster. It takes serious upfront capital to set up films at that budget level. There's a whole lot of issues that go along with the idea of producing a really expensive film like that. And since most new producers don't understand that kind of thing, when they start talking about producing a million or a $5 million film or even a $500,000 film, I start to get really itchy because I think you're pretty much headed for disaster unless you have other people working with you who have produced films at that budget level, in which case chances are you don't really have to do that very much. You just have to watch them work. It makes me wonder what you are bringing to the table that they will let you do that. I also think it's a disaster when a film causes you legal problems, whether you run afoul of the employment people here in the state of California who expect everybody to get a minimum wage and expect everybody to have workers' comp insurance if they're working on a set, whether or not you don't own the rights to the script that you're shooting, whether or not you don't have releases from your DP or your actors, whether or not you're not keeping good enough records or you haven't set up a business, all those legal problems can spell disaster for a, a new filmmaker. Sometimes people do get around to producing a film, but it is not well done, so it makes them look incompetent or unprofessional. For example, it has bad sound, the actors are miscast, it has a script that's not well written. All of those kinds of things represent a film that though it's produced and may have been educational to produce, doesn't actually meet the requirement of being a film that's going to serve you well in years to come. In fact, it's the kind of film you're going to be hiding from and you're going to be praying nobody ever gets to see. A disaster film, a bad film, makes it so you have to learn everything the hard way and it makes you want to quit. It makes you never want to make another movie again for the rest of your life. A Triumph is a film that's quickly finished, in my opinion. It provides good value for dollars. Let's say you spend $10,000 or $20,000 or $50,000 on the film, but it looks like you spend half a million. A Triumph demonstrates what you do best creates good connections because you your behavior on set and the business that you set up and the way that you treat your cast and crew all combine together to make people have nothing but good things to say about you. That kind of reputation is very important here in Hollywood because when you get a bad reputation, people know about it. 
Um, people hear about it year after year. And when you have a good reputation, people hear about that year after year as well. And finally, a triumph of a film is something that makes you want to do the next film. So in, over the course of uh, this particular workshop, we're going to be talking about how to have a film that's a triumph rather than a disaster. I personally think after years of watching people do this and having worked with a number of people on their first films and also having worked with people that are more skilled and have produced lots of projects, I think the most important thing you can do is actually set very specific objectives. Is your objective to learn how to produce a film? That's a perfectly good reason to decide to produce your first film. The best way to learn how to make movies is actually to start making movies. So that's one objective, learn how to produce a film. Tell people about things that matter to me. A lot of people, that, especially a lot of people that come to my events, many of them have the desire to be create some kind of activist media. Sometimes they want to talk about climate change. Sometimes they want to talk about you know the economy. Sometimes they want to talk about social issues. People who want to talk to the world have used films ever since they were invented in order as a means of communication. And creating that kind of media sometimes can be a great way for a filmmaker to get discovered. If you produce a documentary about poverty or you produce a documentary about the foster care system, that can be a great way for you as a filmmaker, even as a documentary filmmaker or as a regular filmmaker to create something that is widely liked and that gets you a lot of work going forward and creates you a lot of opportunity going forward. Sometimes people want to produce a film just because they are actors or writers or producers and they wanna work with their friends. They wanna to try to collaborate. And sometimes it's a great creative event. Sometimes it's a great social event. Sometimes people wanna create a film because they wanna sell it for a profit. Sometimes they create a film because they wanna to go to, to submit it to film festivals and win so they can say that they're an award-winning producer or an award-winning writer or an award-winning performer. Sometimes they wanna create a film that proves their creative worth as a producer, writer, director, or performer. If you think about Quentin Tarantino, he wouldn't have a career if he hadn't had the opportunity to produce a huge number of independent films. You know, I think Reservoir Dogs and so forth gave some sense of his voice and some sense of his ability to capture the eye and to, and to stir the heart. And it made it so people were willing to give him more and more money over time. George Lucas started his career with THX 1138. Sometimes, people are creating a film that they feel strongly, that they want something that they own, that they could do pretty much whatever they want to with. And they don't want to go to vet, get into debt. They don't want to get into legal or tax trouble. They just want to create an asset that they own that they can use in any way that they feel like. Or you may have other objectives. There could be a million different reasons why you want to produce a film, but you need to be able, you need to write down what your specific objectives are because every decision you make after that is going to be based upon those decisions. I personally think if you want a painless, painless, straightforward, easy to produce film, that you should really pick no more than three of these kinds of objectives. So for example, if I say, I wanna learn how to produce a film, I wanna tell people about things that matter to me, and I want to let create a film I can own completely without going into debt or creating legal or tax trouble, that's a straightforward film. Right, because I don't have to work with my friends, which brings its own hassles. I don't have to worry about trying to make a profit. All I'm gonna to try to do is produce something that's cheap and straightforward that talks about the thing that I wanna talk about. It sets up a whole set of decisions for me that make my life easier. If I said that I wanna create a film that where I work with my friends and that I can submit to, to film festivals and win, that's great. It makes your film so much more straightforward when you know that your big objective is to work with your friends. That's the most, that's a key issue. Like you don't want to produce it if you're not working with your friends. So if you bring your friends on board and they cause trouble, okay, there's no problem with that because part of your reason for doing the film at all is to have that social engagement. My point is be really clear upon your objectives and use those objectives to make decisions for you, right? If you say that you're going to create a film that proves your creative worth as a producer, writer, director, or performer, that means you're going to be one, the one making the decisions. If you want to prove your worth as a writer, you're going to be the screenwriter. You're not going to bring in an outside screenwriter. And since you want to make sure you have total control, you're probably going to be the writer, producer, director. Those three things together cut down your costs rather remarkably. 
because for a fact that you're going to be producing the film. So you don't have to look for people to play those roles. You may look for additional consultations or advice, but you don't bring anybody else onto the project because you want to showcase your skills. I think if you start with a clear set of objectives and you know exactly what they are, you sidestep a lot of hassles and a lot of problems. And if you don't, what happens is you try to do five or six of these things at one time. I want to make a film with my friends that I can sell for a profit, that I can submit to film festivals and win. And I don't want to get into legal or tax trouble. Okay, do you have a lot of money? Because that's what that's going to take. You're increasing your cost dramatically with every single one of those things that you tack on to your project. The next thing is really important. If you think about a film as just 90 good minutes, it really makes a huge difference to the ease with which you can produce a project. In my experience, most people that produce films for a living really do think in terms of good minutes. They need 90 good minutes for a film. And if they're producing a short film, it's basically gonna be between 10 and 40 minutes. 40 is pretty much the longest you can have a film and still call it short. And a documentary will usually be between 60 and 90 minutes. When you understand that your objective is just to get 90 good minutes and you might get the opening might start with a minute of footage from Pond 5, an opening establishing shot created with drones. That's one minute down and 10 minutes in the living room of the haunted house and five minutes in the bedroom, right? And if you really start thinking about your film in, in that way, minute to minute to minute, it gets much easier to produce. The next thing I would say is Good plays really become good feature films because they all take place on a single stage. They offer, often represent just one to three locations. So they have set changes to make you go from place to place. The characters and situations are inherently interesting because they have to be. So as you're starting to produce a project, particularly if it's going to be a feature film, start reading good plays and you'll start seeing how to size and scope your project for a good feature film. You want lots of drama, a good hook that engages people and a small cast. If you were producing a short film, you wanna look at one act plays because they're almost always set in a single location with just one to three characters. I think if you, if you plan your feature film and you start reading those, start reading plays and start reading one act plays, like normal plays and then one act plays, you'll get a sense for what your script should look like. When it comes to documentaries, they're usually a series of interviews that tell a story or reveal facts. And they're usually supported by stock footage, cheap location shots. Sometimes they have reenactments and occasionally they have a narrator. Now what's great about documentaries, a highly overlooked first film op option is that you usually don't have to pay people that you interview. You're not actually hiring them by the hour. If you are looking for something that it's easy to get 90 good minutes of, it's pretty easy to find. <laughs> if you get 10 good interviews, with people talking about poverty. It's pretty straightforward for you to turn that into a documentary because 10 people are gonna talk for an hour each, that's 10 hours of footage and you only need to get 90 good minutes out of it. If you're doing a feature film, you're shooting a film using a mix of live action, stock footage and green screen, but you can also create animated films or animated sequences using tools like Character Animator from Adobe. Or it could be you want to make first film an animated project. It's a talking head South Park style project. and there are tools that make that relatively straightforward. And when you do that, you pretty much just need a voiceover. So you need a script and you need a voiceover. And then you need to learn how to use the animation tools like Character Animator. I think Adobe has other animation tools you should also look at. A lot of people are producing professional quality animation using Adobe and putting it into distribution. Stock footage sites make it easy to find establishing shots. Stock footage sites are a great way for you to find all kinds of content very cost effectively, and it can make your project seem much, much bigger. Just because it may be the case that you find a house that you want to use as a haunted house, and it may be the case that house happens to be in the woods, your establishing shot could be a drone, drone footage following a car through down a country lane that has trees on either side. So you don't have to actually go out and shoot that footage, which saves you a lot of time and money. You can just use footage that already exists. Shooting on green screen also lets you put your actors in almost any location. If you need to have your actors have a scene in Paris, or if you want to have them have a scene in Rome, or you want to put them beside a rolling river, you can have you can use green screen to create that background, and then you can just put your characters in front of it. 
you as a producer learning how to do green screen is relatively straightforward. It's not rocket science. Almost any DP that you could conceivably work with will know how to do green screen, and it can make a huge impact on reducing your budget. I strongly recommend that people who are producing a film, any film, but especially their first film, sit down and actually document what's going to happen, <laughs> like literally every five minutes in their film. If you, there's a couple of different reasons to do that. I think it's a good idea to create this kind of little Bible, even before you have a screenplay, because it lets you as the creator of the project experiment with maybe two, three, four, five different options. It could be the case that you create, you have sort of an idea in your head and you try to fill in the film planning book by filling in the blanks. Like you put in the key image. This is what the most important image is in the first five minutes. And this is what the most important image is in the second five minutes, et cetera. Like it's very easy for you to think of your film in those terms. And by the time you're done, but filling in these blanks and putting little images, maybe whether you draw them or you find photographs that represent those images, by the time you've created that little, in effect, Bible, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the movie will look like. And what if you decided before you began to hire a screenwriter or write the screenplay, what if you did that four or five or six times so that you had the opportunity to choose between four, five or six movies instead of just picking the first one that came into your head? you may very well find that your first, second, and third idea aren't as good as your fourth, fifth, and sixth idea. And if all you have to do is fill out eight pages in order to create these little notebooks, you may very well find you save yourself a lot of time and money and you end up with a better film. If you have difficulty figuring out how this might work, try printing out the film planning document and doing and filling in the blanks for a film that you know really well. For example, Paranormal Activity. Let's say that you've seen Paranormal Activities. Try to pretend you're the maker of Paranormal Activities and figure out how you would fill in the blank for what your objectives are, what your key assets and resources are, what your similar films are, and then think about what happens in the first five minutes and what's the key scene that makes the first five minutes go. And do it again for the second five minutes, etc. By the time you're done filling in the blanks for this film you already know, that already exists in the world, you'll have a good idea how to handle the same process for creating the film that you actually want to produce. This is a really good exercise and it's very satisfying exercise because in a sense, you're acting like a real producer. You're actually picking between multiple projects instead of just taking the first one that comes into your head. Once you have a pretty good idea of the film that you wanna create, you are gonna to have to have a screenplay. A screenplay is an important thing. While it is possible, if you have a lot of money, to shoot a film like Apocalypse Now, where the screenplay is more of an idea than an actual screenplay, smart people who want to actually get their film produced are going to go ahead and just <laughs> actually write a screenplay because a screenplay is basically a Bible for the shoot. Every single person that's working on your project, from the people that are buying the costumes or getting the locations, or the people that are shooting each scene, or the actors that are performing in the project use the screenplay as a Bible. So without a screenplay, you're gonna have a, a lot of difficulty. I think personally, the easiest way for you to get a screenplay for your first project is literally to write one. Now you may not consider yourself a great writer and you may think to yourself that it would be easier to buy a screenplay. I would suggest that if you want to have a project that is hits all the numbers that really matter to you, it's probably better if you at least write the first draft of the screenplay because you can then bring in a writer to clean it up or to give you ideas about it. But that first draft is important from a variety of perspectives. One, you can take that first draft, register at the copyright office, and then you have a screenplay. And if you bring in people to give you notes or give you suggestions, as long as you okay those changes, you still own the screenplay. If somebody says, I think this passage is too long and I make that change, it doesn't mean that they own the screenplay. And I, if they say this character, I think should be a boy rather than a girl, it doesn't mean that they own the screenplay. I'm the one making the changes. It's my screenplay. And you may find that writing the screenplay lets you get more of what you want, costs less, and sidesteps the cost of actually having to purchase a screenplay in a way that's actually very helpful to you for your first project. It also gives you a lot of flexibility if it turns out that 
during production, you have to make a change. For example, the farmhouse isn't available and you have to shoot in the barn. You could call, it would be a drag to be on set, have to make that choice and then have to find the screenwriter and get his help making the change to the screenplay. You might as well go ahead and make the change yourself. We have several shops that cover how to write a screenplay. And in fact, there's one up there on how to draft a screenplay in 40 to 80 hours using sprint writing techniques. I think if you created that film workbook that I talked previously, and then you from that, you start drafting your screenplay, I think it's very straightforward for you to have a, a screenplay, like 90 pages of, of screenplay in about 40 to 80 hours. I think it's a very straightforward process for most people. If you take time to draft your screenplay, you can get coverage from professional readers who will tell you what needs to change or make it better. I think a lot of times people don't write a screenplay because they don't know how to make it perfect. There are coverage, if you write a screenplay, even if it's <laughs> really bad, you can submit it to professional readers. There's a whole bunch of companies you can submit it to. I, in the past, I've used We Screenplay, and I submit it to them, and I get three. You can request multiple readers. I request multiple readers that like horror or whatever, and then they'll send me the, their coverage back, and they'll have very complete notes to talk about what's wrong. They might say, this character is one-dimensional, or... I don't believe this character, I don't believe what this character does over the course of the project. I think it would be better if they did this and this. And you can take that coverage, incorporate it into your script, make it better. And you'll have a screenplay as good as you probably can afford to buy on your first film. And you won't have had to pay for it in terms of hiring a writer and dealing with all the intellectual property rights involved. If you do decide you want to purchase a screenplay, you can go to sites like inktip.com. There's a whole bunch of screenplays available for sale. There's also a whole bunch of short films, screenplays that you can purchase if, by making a deal with the writers. If you do acquire a screenplay from somebody else, if you didn't write it, you are going to need a lawyer to make sure that you purchase the right rights from the writer in order to be able to shoot your film, make the changes that you want to make if you have to make them and then go on to distribute the film in terms of selling it or making it available free online. So you're gonna to have to have a lawyer. You're probably gonna to have to have a lawyer anyway, but you'll specifically need one if you need to acquire a screenplay. You may, if you write your screenplay yourself, you may need, to, you may need or want to talk to a lawyer just to talk about registering at the copyright office, something that you can choose to do. You may wanna chat with your lawyer briefly if you have any questions about that process. Once you've got a screenplay, and especially if you've previously done the film planning work that we talked about previously, your next step really is to start creating a budget for your project. The reason that I say that is by the time you've got a screenplay and you have the beginnings of a storyboard and a beat sheet laid out, then you're in a position where you can actually start putting numbers to things. If you, generally speaking, to the extent that you can, I think you'll be happiest if your first film project uses assets that you can get for free, like locations you or your family and friends own, props that they own, et cetera. You save a lot of money. If your project, if you can get your costumes for free or you can get them at the thrift store, that's also handy. And if you have, or let's say you've been hanging out with the rent fair people and you want to set something, some sort of time travel thing. What a great thing to know those rent fair people because not only can they appear in your project, but they'll have their own costumes. Any element that you can acquire or get for cheap will help you be much better off financially. That said, you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be able to hire your cast and your crew for cheap. You're not going to want to pay them less than minimum wage for the time that they're shooting because that's illegal. But if you can get everything else for free, that would be just great. Or as much as you can for free, that would be great. So to create a budget, you're going to look at each scene in your screenplay and you're going to list all the elements. And then you're going to put a price on each element. The reason that you need the screenplay first is because you need to know how many scenes you have, how many are shot in the same location, because that lets you figure out how many hours you need each actor for. I have a workshop that dives deep on how to create a budget and talks about a variety of different techniques, including just using a spreadsheet to create one. When you get a chance, you might wanna take a look at it. It's a very fast process once you have the screenplay. You are gonna to have to pay cast and crew a minimum wage and you're gonna to have to cover them with workers' comp insurance. You really have to do that. The reason you have to do that is it's incredibly risky for you personally if you don't. If somebody's working on your set as your actor and they fall or they get hurt or they cut their arm and they're not covered by workers' comp, you are not only responsible for their medical bills, <laughs> you've got other troubles with the state of California. So 
to employ people legally and to cover them with workers' compensation is not expensive. It's really not a hassle. You can use sites like Gusto or ADP to who will handle payroll for you and handle sending out people's tax forms to them and will handle they handle they can handle a whole bunch of things for you and they can also cover your cast and crew very cost effectively with workers comp by the hour or however long by the time you're working on in other words it's just very much less expensive to use those kinds of services than trying to set up your own payroll or paying people under the table it's just not worth it to do that you are also going to need to spend money on an attorney to create cast and crew agreements the reason that this is important is that you're without those agreements you don't really have the ability to distribute your film. You need signatures for releases from the cast and releases from the crew who, for example, the DP, if you're a photographer and you take a photograph, you own the photograph, right? The DP is on your set and he's shooting a film. He owns the film, right? Unless he signed a release and he was only going to sign a release if you pay him. So you need an attorney to create those documents so that you can you can legally own the thing that you're planning on distributing for free or the thing you may want to sell one day or the thing that you want to submit to film festivals. The attorney may also help you set up an LLC or a corporation as well. The reason you do these things is to, to protect your personal assets. And you may only set up your company. You may set up a company. It may only be work for a month or three months. And then you may close the company down at the end of that process. In, when you talk to a lawyer, you can discuss how long your company needs to be open for. You may talk to a tax advisor about what's involved in being able to deduct your film expenses from your taxes, because that's a really important thing. Let's say that you are a person, you work a nine to five job, you make X amount of money. Wouldn't it, nice to be, wouldn't it be nice to be able to deduct all the money that you're spending on your film from your taxes? Wouldn't that be great? Because that would make it so that you know, you'd have the opportunity to not just eat that cost as if you were buying a vacation or something, you're actually making a business investment. So it's good to be able to talk to your tax advisor and talk to your attorney, figure out whether or not you need to set up a company because it may make it so that you can deduct the expenses of producing your film. And you may decide that you want to have one film that produces multiple projects. Who knows? You are probably going to need film production insurance as well. In fact, you're almost certainly going to know it. Film production insurance ensures like the property damage you might do. Like you, you're shooting a horror film. You've driven your little truck up to the horror film and you managed to hit the garage and you break the... If you have film production insurance, it might well very might cover that cost. Or let's say you have your DP, he's shooting and his film cameras actually fall down the staircase and they get all broken up. Film production insurance can cover that cost for you. So when you get a chance, there's a whole bunch of different companies that do film production insurance. You literally buy it by the day. I just, I mentioned in passing that if you have a 50 day shoot and a five day shoot, they cost similar amounts of money. In I also want to mention that if you have a five day shoot and there's 10 cast members in, a, in you're insuring 50 people because it's 10 people for five days. You want to make sure that the people that are working on your project are insured for their for the stuff that film production insurance covers. The you can call your insurance provider. You can call whenever you call an insurance company and you say, "Hey, this is what I'm doing." If you explain the details for them, they'll usually try to figure out how to get you the right coverage at the right price. And it's not a hugely expensive thing as a rule. All, you all, I want to also mention you don't have to insure just the days you're shooting. You can also insure extra days. So it may be the case, for example, you're planning to shoot your film over two weekends, but let's say things get screwed up. Why don't you just buy the film and film production insurance for five weekends? That way, if it doesn't work out these two days, the, the two four days that you have planned, the two weekends you have planned, you can go ahead and shoot the following two days, two sets of days without buying new film insurance. I'm a big fan of insurance because it's there for you and helpful to you when nothing else ever is. When things go bad, I wanted to also mention that you can find lots of locations that you can rent for film production specifically on many sites. One of the ones I like to use is peerspace.com. If you look on peerspace.com and you say that you want to do film production, they'll show you a whole bunch of different locations that you can shoot at. Many of them are very cost effective on a daily rate. Cool. So this is an example of micro budget film budgets, right? And it talks about registering the LLC, getting video releases for people in the film, miscellaneous legal advice and forums, etc. And it's just a random budget. And you might create something that looks like this. 
as well. When you're producing something that's a relatively inexpensive film, your budgets aren't really long. If you say that you're gonna produce a million dollar film, this is gonna be 50 or 60 pages. <laughs> if you're just producing a $10,000 film or a $5,000 film, then you might only be looking at three or four pages. If you don't know how to create a budget and check out the workshop that we have on it, if you're gonna be a producer or you're gonna be a writer producer, not knowing how to make a budget is gonna make your career pretty hard to pursue. So it's a good investment to learn how to create those things. Once you've got a budget, once you've got a screenplay, once you've got a film plan, you're gonna go ahead and step into the process of finding your cast and your crew and your equipment. If you are not gonna be shooting with named talent, expensive people as your cast, I suggest that you look at backstage.com to find a lot of actors that are willing to work. And they have both union and non-union talent you can choose the kind of actors that you want to work with. If you're hiring regular actors that are not union, then you can say, I want to hire you to work on this number of days at this time. This is how much you'll get paid. I'm going to use this payroll service to pay you, and I'll send you the information so you can sign up. Bob's your uncle. You can make the same kinds of offers to people that are union actors, and in theory, they should decline. Because if you're a union actor, you're not supposed to work on non-union productions. If a non-union actor chooses to work with you on your production, that's their business because it's up to, so it is possible to be a union actor and go phi core, and then you can work on any project you want, whether it's union or not union, and more and more actors are actually choosing to do that. It's also some actors just go ahead and appear in, on low budget projects because they want to have stuff that they can use on their reels and on their on their demo reels and so forth and because they want to be able to pick up some extra cash and they don't really care if the union finds out about it even though it can cause them a lot of trouble but you can't get in trouble for hiring a non-union actor the actor gets in trouble if you do want to legally if you have an actor that only wants to work as a on a union production then you're going to have to if you want to work with them you're going to have to become a sag signatory you're going to have to join sag in order to work with them and when that happens there's a your costs go up because there's a set of requirements that the union has in order to work with you. They have some basic agreements, which look like they're not going to, don't have a lot of rules, but they actually do. I would suggest that you work with a first AD, first assistant director, who's had previous experience working on a SAG project. If you're going to do a SAG short, a SAG nano budget or no budget or low budget feature, just to make sure that you dot the I's and cross the T's when it comes to the union obligations. Cool. When you look at the SAG indie agreements, you'll notice that when you fill in the blanks on it, it looks relatively straightforward. It's only a few pages long, but you'll see that it refers to something called the basic agreement. And what they're saying is that this is an add-on to the basic agreement. I think sometimes people are surprised how, how complex things get because they may not realize for example, that they may have to put up a bond in order to shoot their project because SAG requires that you be able to pay all your actors if you're going to work on a SAG project and they don't know who the hell you are. So that could be a thing that happens to you. So generally speaking, I think you may want to start with a non-union project as your very first project, and then maybe your next project after that, you do a full board union project. Now, you can go into, if you looking, start looking for crew, there's a whole bunch of different places to look for crew. And you, if you're in the industry, you may know people that are already DPs and sound editors and so forth. If not, I think you may find sites like craigslist.com pretty useful. If you place an ad on Craigslist and you say you're looking for a sound editor for a, feature, a micro budget or nano budget feature film and about a hundred little horror film, and you are going to be shooting for five weekends in January. And you may get 30 people contacting you or 40 people contacting you saying that they want to work on your project. You have to tell them how much you're going to pay them, but or give them some idea. Like you may say, I'm going to pay you $20 an hour or $50 an hour for being a sound engineer on my project. But you'll be shocked how many good quality candidates you get through Craig's, Craigslist. Whether you're casting, getting hiring cast through Backstage West or you're getting a crew through Craigslist.com, you have to make sure that you vet every single person that you might want to work with. I like to have five or six 
good candidates that I've really looked into before I pick the ones that I actually want to work with. My experience is I have hiring people is such a hassle that I tend to shortchange the hiring process unless I have some kind of rules. But if I say I need five good candidates before I choose the one I actually want to work with, I do a lot better. And I do make sure that I look into people that I'm going to work with. You know, I, if they have, ref, I ask them for references and then I contact their references and I look them up on IMDb and I do as much as I can to research them before I start working with them. And in some cases, I may actually set up an extra day. I may say, look, could we go ahead and shoot just, I want to shoot some, if I'm working with a DP, I might say, I want to shoot my rehearsals. So could I just hire you for a couple of days to shoot that? And then if I can't work with them on that day, if I find them difficult to work with it, or it's hard to get my footage or whatever, then I don't, I know I don't want to work with that DP later. Or if I, I have crew and, and I want to shoot the rehearsal and I'm willing to pay them. So when I'm shooting the rehearsal and they're not interested in doing it, then I know that I've got, I may not want to work with this particular crew member. So testing people before you actually work with them can really save you a lot of time and hassle. I want to mention that if you work with a company, a lot of video editing services, sometimes you hire an editor. You can hire a film editor and pay them by the hour like you pay everybody else. Just hire them as an employee and pay them like everybody else. But a lot of video editors actually own their own company. And that company works for the whole bunch of customers. So if they have their own LLC and they are a corporation, it may be the case that you can just pay them a fee to do your editing for you. You'd probably want to chat with your lawyer just to make sure that's kosher. But the point is that different kinds of people that work on your project may, because they own their own companies and because they do something as a business, they may actually, you might not have to hire them as an employee. Cast and crew, most crew, you will have to pay as an employee, but some people like editors and maybe DPs who own their own companies and have their own equipment, you can, you may not, you may just be able to pay them a daily fee to work with you. I want to mention that when it comes to equipment, if you want to shoot your project and you don't want to work, you can, instead of, if you're shooting a documentary or something like that, or you are shooting a very low budget feature and you're just, you're basically going to be behind the camera yourself. You may find shooting your project on cell phone works really well. The phones we have now and have had for a while are high resolution 4K cameras. And there are even lenses that you can put on the little cameras to make it so that you have telephoto and you have macro lenses. It's ridiculous. If I, the reason I mentioned that is sometimes people who are shooting their very first film blow $5,000 on a red camera. <laughs> Don't do that. Or they go and spend $3,000 or $2,000 on a Canon camera. If you've never shot a film before, I think you may want to start with something affordable that is not going to break the bank because who wants to spend that much money on a camera you may not use again because you may want not want to do another film. When you shoot on your cell phone, the content is easy to get off the cell phone because you do that all day every day anyway. And there are a lot of camera apps you can use that let you create very high quality content on your phone. And I'll go back through some of these links at the end of the presentation, but the camera apps like Pro Camera or Halide let you have all the tools you have on a normal manual camera. They let you specify the frame rate. They let you specify the resolution. They let you specify the f-stops, all that stuff. So you can actually get pretty good quality footage out of your camera using these apps. It's professional quality content. I want to equip yourself cost-effectively to shoot your project. You can find tripods and steady cams and photo photographic lights of many varieties and microphones and so forth that work with your phone on Amazon. So when you get a chance, if you don't have the equipment that you need to shoot your project, I would just recommend that instead of spending quite a lot of money to equip yourself or involving yourself with rental houses, you strongly consider working with cell phone technology for your very first project. So this sort of dives into my specific suggestions for, for doing productions. One thing is absolutely certain, make sure that all of your footage is shot at the same resolution. So if you're shooting on a camera, for example, or, or shooting on a cell phone, for example, for choosing the 4K option and selecting three, three the resolution three, 1840 by 2160 standard 4k resolution at 25 frames per second make sure that every single scene that you shoot is shot at that resolution and make sure that if you purchase any stock footage on pond5.com that you buy it at the same frame rate and resolution you want 100 percent of your content to be at the same frame rate and the same resolution 
that makes it so that the content is easiest to find distribution for. I mean, it's a minimum requirement for people like iTunes and, and Amazon if you want to sell your product through their stores. And it's the sign of a good filmmaker that you're switching between frame rates and resolutions throughout your film. Which, that's just not going to look very good. The next thing I'd say is make sure you record your dialogue in a silent environment if possible. If you're going to have a party where people, the beloved couple are talking to one another, you want to make sure that there's nothing, people can pretend to talk in the background, but do not actually have them be talking. The reason is that you want the audio to be on its own track so that if you edit it, um, you don't hear gaps in background music or crowd murmur and so forth. The other thing I'd mention is if there's music on in the background, you probably don't own the rights to that music. So you're going to get in trouble if you just if you keep that music in your film. So you want to record in a silent environment, if at all possible. And you want to make sure, generally speaking, you want to have your act actors mic'd or you want to use a boom mic to get the best possible sound. If you are going to put music in your project, it's best to use non-PRO royalty-free music because otherwise you're going to owe royalties for the music you use and you're going to have other obligations to fulfill. So Pond5. I don't get any, but I should mention for those of us that are new, I don't get any, I don't take kickbacks for anybody that I recommend. I, or I don't get any affiliate fees or any of that stuff. I just recommend the, the folks I like and the people that I work, I enjoy working with. So pond5.com makes it pretty easy to get music very cost effectively. And they also can give you sound effects like doors closing and opening steps, going up, people walking across steps, rivers murmuring, et cetera. And they also have all the have a whole bunch of stock footage and they're very cost effective. There's certainly competitors for all those things. Use whoever you like best. Make sure that that when you're shooting your project, you don't have mechanical noises like fans or airplanes or equipment operating or anything else in the background of your audio. Because if you do, when you cut, you'll hear the change in the sound of that, the background sounds. And it's really hard to get those background sounds out of your content. So don't just be aware of music and, or people talking in the background, be aware of any background sound. One of the reasons that I strongly urge you to hire a sound engineer to work on your project is because they will make sure, help you make sure that the sound quality is actually good. And for many festivals and for many distributors and for many normal audience members, bad sound makes a film unwatchable. When you get done with your project, do make sure you register at the copyright office. You may wanna talk with your attorney about specifically how to do that and what to put on the forms. The, that if you're going to be shooting a film right now, there are COVID protocols you have to pay attention to, and they do vary from state to state. So if you happen to be taking, if you decide you're going to shoot your Wisconsin in November, you know, they may not have COVID protocols, but if you're shooting it in here in Los Angeles, there will be some kind, very likely will be some kind of COVID protocols to be aware of. Just make sure so that you don't get in trouble on, on or get sidelined by that kind of hassle. The, there's a link when you click on COVID protocols in the documentation that I've just made available to you through the chat window. If you click on it, it tells about COVID protocols around the world. And I wouldn't mention shooting outside California is not a bad idea. If you have the ability to shoot outside California, if you're, the, your family has a cabin or you can rent one in Wyoming or Wisconsin or Iowa or Maine or whatever, that might be a better place to shoot than here. And you can use Backstage to actually find actors that work there as well. So Backstage, sorry, Backstage.com actually lets you hire actors throughout the United States. And I think that you actually may be able to hire them around the world, but I wouldn't bet a million dollars. I bet you there's people from all over the world that are available through that site for voiceover work, but I don't know how many of them, I don't know if you wanted to cast and shoot something in Mexico, that would be easy to do using their support. Anywhere in the United States though, they've got great coverage. And I think you may find that if you are gonna shoot your project you, and you want to hire like a DP that happens to work in any particular state, I bet you can find DPs that work in every state through craigslist.com or through the film. Every state has its own little film commission. If you Google New Mexico Film Commission or New Mexico or Ohio Film Commission, you'll see that they have a website. And if you look on it, you'd be shocked at how many people are listed there who would be glad to help you make your film in those states. I just mentioned shooting outside California only because it may be the case that you can bring more visual value to your project if you can, it's less expensive to shoot in other states and you may want to be able to show 
some of their natural beauty or some of the things that's unique to them that we haven't seen a lot of times. California, especially Los Angeles, is there a corner of it we haven't seen yet? I don't know. After your film is done, if you've got a good film, you may find distribution for it or sell it directly to audiences on your own profitably. We just did a workshop like a week ago or a week or two ago that talks about all the different ways to distribute your distribute your work. We talked about OTT sites. We talked about Amazon. We talked about sites like Viewler and Program Buyer, et cetera, where you can make projects available for sale. We talked about a whole bunch of different options. If you're going to work with a major distributor, like a big time distributor for your film, whether it's your first film or any other film, chances are, or if you're doing a distributing a documentary, you're probably going to have to buy errors and omissions insurance called ENO insurance for your film. And that helps cover if anything that you might have done wrong when you were setting up your production documents and any claim that might come from anybody saying that you did something wrong. If you if you are doing a documentary and somebody says the way you cut the film damaged their reputation, you know, insurance would likely be the thing that would cover that. Some distributors may also have specific deliverables they want you to provide. And there are services that you can use to create those deliver deliverables if desired. There's a couple of links here. When you work with a big distributor, <laughs> they don't just want you to give them a, an MOV file or an MP4 file. They may want you to give them separate audio tracks and they may want you to give them caption, captcha, capture information for all of the dialogue in your project so they can create the captions. And all of those kinds of things are stuff you, if you don't know how to do, there's people that can actually help you. And I created links for them. You can submit your film to film festivals. What's interesting is that there's, there's, there's services that you can use that will submit you to mo multiple film festivals if desired. And it could be the case that one film that you produce that you might spend $200 or $300 or $500 on festival fees, and you might win two or three awards if you've actually produced a good film, specifically because not as many people as you think actually sign up to invest in film festivals. It's not as common, I think, as it used to be in earlier times. Nowadays, since people can distribute their work in so many different ways, they're not as interested in having festival approval. In the old days, festivals used to be the way people got distribution. When you finish your project, do remember to make sure that you list your film on IMDb and make sure you give credit to yourself and to all the people who helped you make the project. One of the reasons people do films, first films particularly, is because they want to have credits. So the people that are working with you, especially if they're more experienced, your credit actually matters a great deal to them. If you want to make sure that your first film is easy, I would suggest the following. Write the script yourself shoot in a single location that you can shoot in free, like a farmhouse, an office building after hours, or whatever. Work with a very small cast and crew. Shoot the film quickly using simple technology like cell phones, photography lights, green screen if desired. Find a way to get the, the images that you need on screen as required to tell your story as quickly, as cost effectively as possible. Do pay a sound engineer so that you get good sound. Another good re reason to work with a sound engineer is they come with their own mics. They come with their own recorder. They come with their own mics. <laughs> so that right there saves you a lot of money. And then they're on your set and they make sure that you get good sound. So they do a lot for the money that they earn. You want to make sure that you back up your work as you work. So every single day or after, maybe even after every shot, you want to make sure that if it's shot being shot on camera, or it's being shot on cell phone, that that content is downloaded onto a, a hard drive, like a SSD drive, or downloaded in such a fashion that it can't possibly be lost. And you want to make sure that you maintain control of that. Be many a person has shot a film and not take and not done that, and then they found out that even though they shot nine, many hours of footage, they don't they lost thirty minutes of their film because somebody forgot to clear the camera before. To, to back up the camera before they cleared it in order to take the next set of shots. So you are making, make sure that you back up the data after every single shot or several times a day, just to make sure that you don't lose any single image that you've actually captured. Make sure that you use legally licensed stock footage, sound, and non-PRO music. Don't steal from other people because your film's not going to go away. It's going to be around for years to come. So they have an infinite period of time to come after you. So just don't. Edit the film yourself using iMovie or Adobe Premiere. If you don't know how to use those tools, it's a good time to learn. Adobe Premiere, I think you can rent. You, I think you can rent it by the month for under fifty bucks. So there's no reason not to do that. 
I, I would suggest if it's your very first film that you shoot non-union because becoming signatory comes with the costs and compliance requirements that you may not be familiar with. And you will probably, at least in my experience, probably have to get a first AD who know, understands the SAG regulations and complies with them in order to make sure that you don't run afoul of the union at some point. Be particularly aware of the fact that they may require you to put up a bond to shoot your film. So just they may you just make, need to make sure you fully understand before you decide to become a union company. Make sure there are no stunts of any kind. Never have any stunts in your first film ever of any kind for any reason because this vastly increases your insurance costs. People get injured all the time when people are doing stunts, especially first time filmmakers. If you want to have there's a you can actually pay an animator <laughs> to do to create little digital characters and di little digital characters can fall off a bridge. Okay, <laughs> so. That's the only kind of stunt you should do is the kind where there's no real people involved and you just create like little digital copies of them and you shoot them or you kill them or do other things to them. You'd be shocked at how many good animators there are that may be able to help you with that kind of thing. It will increase your cost, but nothing like trying to do live stunts on your project. If you want to shoot a project that is likely to be the easiest and fastest project to produce and likely to be a very good credit, I strongly urge you to consider doing a documentary. You don't have to pay actors. You don't have to pay doctors because they're not actors. You, you don't have to pay, sorry, you don't, you don't have to pay your documentary guests because they're not actors. You may give them a stipend or a reward, but usually they're speaking because what you're doing supports work that they're already doing. So finding a cause that you wanna do a documentary about finding individuals who want to talk about something they're passionate about. Those kinds of things are a great thing to build a documentary around. And documentaries, really, it's just, usually it's just you and the your cameraman and your sound guy. And you just go from place to place doing interviews. Or alternatively, you can go to peer space, rent locations, have people come to that location, and you can shoot them there in these little environments that you've licensed on peer space and you can get your the footage that you need to produce your project really fast it's documentaries are much much easier than feature films because you don't they don't require nearly the amount of preparation and they don't require the, the same level of expenditure so there's a whole bunch of additional resources and information you can find in our video library you can see it listed here and you can find links in the documentation that come with this particular event so I'm going to just go quickly back through a couple of the links that we had here, because I think they may be important to you. So if you are looking for something that you can learn how to do and you've got a strong desire to do animation, you want to produce animation, I think learning character animator and doing your first project in character animator is a really smart idea. So when you get a chance, take a look at that. If you click, when you look through the documentation, this is the, gives you a link to how to create green screen content. And if we go to Pond5, this is the place I've been talking about where you can buy footage and music, photo illustrations, etc. When you buy music, do make sure that if I say, for example, I want to buy rock music. And make sure that you do click on non-PRO. And if you, there's, a, there's, there's other links in the documentation that talk about why that's important, but specifically it means that you're not going to have ongoing obligations to pay to deal with for the music. You can buy it and use it in your project without, as long as you're compliant with the terms of the license, which doesn't, which is a big time saver and a big for a wide variety of reasons. We already talked about this document the film planning document. And I can go ahead and let's see, if I go up here to the top of the screen and I click at the film planning notebook, you'll see that it basically just makes you write down what you're gonna do for each five minutes of your film. And it assumes that you're not gonna have more than 105 minutes, which is a smart thing to assume for a film that's your first project. And let's see. We talked about a variety of different ways to produce screenplays. And I did mention inktip.com where you can actually purchase a screenplay. Filmmakers find your scripts fast and easy, get access to good writers, et cetera. And writers, if you happen to be a writer and you wanna sell your screenplays, you might find listing them on inktip works really well for you.
So go to site says California. I can obviously have any state that I want to shoot in. I say film shoot, combined daily attendance. And it says 50 people in one day, but it may be the case that I want them for 10 days. And notice that, and it's if it's if it's 50, if it's 10 people for 10 days, that's actually a hundred. And notice it doesn't really change things that much. So it, what I, my point being, if you mess around with this, it's shocking. You, you might as well go ahead and get the max significant length of time and set up for a significant length of people. If you have questions, and I think you probably will, you can contact these guys and there's like a contact button down here and you can get more information. There's a lot of people that are selling insurance for this kind of application these days. You can look for competitors to Event Helper if you like. I've just used them in the past and like them. We also talked about, we also talked about peerspace.com. And I mentioned that you could search for film space here in, La sorry, film shoot here in Los Angeles, and it'll give you all the different kinds of places that you can shoot your project at. Cool. So when you get a chance, you can go ahead and look that, check out locations that you can rent cost quickly and cost effectively through those guys. And let's see, we talked about casting people through backstage.com. I have a workshop that talks specifically about working with backstage and I'll go ahead and look at it here, backstage.com. Right, and you can click on find talent. You can cast people. Just be make sure that when you're working with cast, you are very um, straightforward about what you're offering in terms of money, what you're going to require from them in terms of role, and be very respectful and considerate of them because you're not going to be paying them a lot of money. And so make, if you're going to, for every hour that you pay them, they're going to be doing a lot more work because my experience is with most actors, particularly if they're good actors, they're going to be very well prepared by the time they get to set. They're going to be willing to participate in doing rehearsals. You're going to be taking up a lot of their time. So just be really kind and nice. Polite is everything. And let's see. I guess we did talk a little bit about camera apps. And I think I did mention to that but there's a link here you can click on. And it'll give you a list of the good cam camera apps you can use on your on iPhone, for example. And it'll show you like all the different tools all of them provide. And it's really amazing. So when you get a chance, if you're looking for apps, you can experiment with before you start deciding to produce your project. You might want to check out that link. There's we also talked about steady cams. Another reason to shoot on your phone is you can get stuff like steady cams that for a camera is really expensive, but for your phone, it's not really expensive. So as you can see, the, nothing is really expensive when it comes to involve, when it involves a phone for some reason. So it's really your phone could be one of the best shooting solutions you have. And in fact, you may decide to buy multiple phones. <clears throat> so if you say, for example, you want to buy a refurbished iPhone, right? A 64 gigabyte XR is $244. So you're not going to get a camera that's comparable to that. They can do all the same things and that's as easy to use. So you might decide to buy two or three cameras, sorry, two or three phones that you use to shoot on, which will guarantee that you get the same footage from all of them and you can use the same application for all of them. It's just something to consider if you want to streamline your production requirements. If you're a cameraman and you already have your own equipment, then you know it's not something you'll be thinking about. Let's see. We talked about SAG Indie. So it says become a signatory and here's how you get started. And it says, here's the stuff. You need to notice that they want you to start in advance of production. Notice that it wants you to have a budget. Notice that it wants you to have a script. And it says, are you gonna be filming entirely in the United States? and then figure out which agreement your film will fall under. And you can go ahead and click on the links and read through the agreement. Right? And you'll see the contract that it's available. That's available. And I, if you're going to sign this particular contract, and you don't haven't worked with the unions before, I suggest that you work with an attorney 
just to make sure you understand what you're signing and what your all of your obligations will be under that particular agreement. Cool. Great. And then I think we talked about submitting things to film festivals. Film Freeway is one of the sites you can use to submit to a whole bunch of different film festivals very quickly and cost effectively. There you go. Great. So we've covered sort of a whole bunch of different topics. I'm going to go ahead and just dive in and take a look at the look at the Q and A. See if there's anything interesting going on. So anonymous asks, if in a non-union suit, how risky is it to have a SAG actor be part of the shoot? As we've talked about. The person that's at risk there is the SAG actor. So the thing is, an actor is going to be on screen, right? It's easy for them to be caught working on non-union productions in violation of their union agreement, especially if a project gets really popular. So they can get in trouble, not generally you as a producer, because you didn't sign an agreement with SAG that you were going to obey the union agreements. Whereas every single SAG actor signs an agreement that has rule one, that you will not work for any producer that's not signatory to the SAG agreement. It's generally not risky for you as a producer at this level, as I understand theory, if you hire a non-union actor. If you were doing a 600000 or $1 million or $5 million project and you hired a bunch of union actors to work on your project, even though you were not a SAG project, it could be the case that SAG strikes your set and tells those people that if they don't leave, you're going to, they're going to get thrown out of the, out of SAG. There's, they could do things that would shut you down, but it's unlikely that on a little micro budget project, they would hear about the project and decide to do it. All right. I had a good time hanging out with you guys and I hope you look for, I hope you enjoy the video, but it comes available and that you like the workbooks and so forth. Have a great evening. Okay. <laughs>